What's going on, gardeners? It's Friday, May 5th, and it is a beautiful afternoon here on the southeastern coast of North Carolina. My early attempts at growing sweet corn ended in total failure every single time. But last year, I finally cracked the code, and I had success for the first time ever growing perfect sweet corn in my backyard garden. That's why on today's video, I'm going to share with you the four changes that I made that revolutionized the way that I grow sweet corn in my backyard garden. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell to receive new video notifications and check out our Amazon store and Spreadshop links in the video description for everything I use in my garden and awesome custom designed apparel and other gear. Your support is greatly appreciated. When it comes to most crops that we grow in the backyard garden, corn may be the most challenging. You can be a master gardener at growing many of the most common summer vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, and squashes, and you can struggle mightily with corn. And that is the exact problem I was having. Corn just has totally different requirements and grows totally differently than most of the things that we're used to growing. And I failed at growing it for years. But last year, I finally cracked the code and I want to share with you the mistakes I was making and how I figured them out and corrected them while the season is still young so you can avoid any of these mistakes yourself. The first change I made was I found a way to plant my corn more deeply. That is because corn is highly prone to being blown over in windstorms and spring is typically the windiest season of the year because where cold air comes down and meets the warm air coming up when they clash at that same gradient right there that's what generates the wind and because there's so many temperature fluctuations in spring more than any other season that's why spring storms tend to be the windiest all year for the most part now in typical agriculture you see these enormous fields of corn that are planted and because the corn fields are so large they effectively act as a windbreak against themselves so they can tolerate wind unless it's just so severe that the whole field collapses, which unfortunately does happen from time to time. However, in the backyard garden, there's no real windbreak from the corn themselves. Unless you put up some type of artificial windbreak, they are going to blow down in many cases if you have a really bad windstorm. The way that big farms protect against their corn from blowing over is they hill the corn. After it gets to a certain height, they come in with a wheel hoe or with some type of tractor, and then they pile up the dirt around the rows of corn. But that's not really possible in a raised bed garden. Because I was only planting my corn seeds about one inch deep, because that's all you can plant them if you want them to germinate, once they would pop up, I was with limited options as to how I could have hilled them in a raised bed garden. So eventually we'd get that nasty windstorm, it would come in and it would blow down half my corn, and I'd have to find a way to pick them up and stake them in some way so I'd be able to continue my corn season. Now the way I handled this last year was very successful. I started my corn in transplant trays. That way I would wait until they were about one foot tall for me to go out and plant them into my garden. And this had two different effects. Number one, it allowed me to protect the corn from any kind of wind when they were young. I planted the corn seeds on schedule and I kept them in a sheltered position away from the wind until I carried them out into my garden. So that protected them for the first month or so of their life. Then when I took them out into my garden, I planted them more more deeply because I already had that well-formed root ball. So because I was able to plant them deeply inside my raised beds, it almost had a hilling effect. So I was able to avoid the windiest weather of early spring and still get a really deep planting on them. So it was almost like hilling my corn in a sense. This year, I took a different approach with my corn. I did not start them out in transplant trays like I did last year. Instead, what I did was I dug these trenches that were about four inches deep and I piled all the dirt around them. And and then I planted my corn seeds one inch deep inside of the trenches. And then I've been fertilizing them inside the trenches with things like all-purpose organic fertilizer and blood meal and dressing them inside that trench. Then once these get to be about one foot tall, I will then collapse all of these trenches around the corn so I will be able to bolster them with an additional three to four inches of the native soil plus some compost and some mulch as well to give them a little bit more support. So by installing them in these deep trenches, I'm basically able to kind of hill them in a raised bed. Now if I could do things all over again, I think I prefer the transplanting method that I did last year versus this trench planting method that I'm doing this year. I think that 
the transplants just came out neater and cleaner overall. However, if you are growing corn in raised beds and you have issues with your corn plants blowing over, especially early in the season, consider either of these methods. They will bolster the corn a little bit more and give them more wind resistance. The second change that I made is that I was not fertilizing my corn nearly enough. Corn is not a vegetable, it is a grain. So it has a completely different growth habit and a completely different requiring for fertilizing than most of our garden vegetables do. And I was basically starving them because I was fertilizing them on the same schedule that I was fertilizing my tomatoes, peppers, and other summer crops. There are two things that you can't find in a modern grocery store these days, affordable high quality meat and organic sweet corn. Now we can have a discussion that'll drag on for days as to why we can't find high quality affordable meat anymore, but the reason why we can't find organic sweet corn is actually really simple. Here in the United States and in many other countries around the world, corn makes up the foundation of the food pyramid for not just us humans, but for many animals as well. Cattle, pigs, chicken, and many other farmed animals are predominantly fed feed that are made mostly out of corn. You can find corn everywhere, even in the fuel industry. And because it has become such a critical crop in agriculture, there are more dollars spent in research and development of new strains of corn than practically any other plant out there. So because there's so much research and development into growing new and better strains of corn, basically millions of years of natural evolution has happened over a relatively short period of time. The fact is, these sugar enhanced and super sweet corn varieties that we grow today just require extreme amounts of fertilizer, especially nitrogen. So if you're trying to grow these new strains of corn organically, you're just not going to succeed unless you spend an enormous amount of money. So I thought to myself, hey, tomato plants are pretty heavy feeders. I'll just feed my corn just like I feed my tomatoes. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Modern sweet corn needs extreme amounts of water-soluble nitrogen. So if you want to grow modern varieties of sweet corn in your backyard garden, you're probably going to have to resort to using soluble, synthesized, high nitrogen fertilizers. And a perfect fertilizer for this is urea nitrogen, which I use to season my straw bales. 4600, you can add this to your fertilizing routine and you're going to have to use it about every seven to 10 days or so and keep those leaves deep, dark green, because if you miss and they start to fade, you may not be able to recover and get them green again. If you don't want to buy a big bag of fertilizer like that, another good option is just good old miracle Grow 24 816 It's very high in nitrogen. You're going to have to give this to them roughly every seven days or so. You really need to keep an eye on the greenness of the leaves and keep them a very deep, dark green. If they start to yellow, it may be too late. I also like using Jack's 202020. It's probably my favorite all-purpose water water-soluble fertilizer. It's great stuff that you can use to boost your corn as well and have success growing sweet corn in your backyard garden. Now, could you grow completely organic sweet corn using high nitrogen organic fertilizers like blood meal and fish emulsion? Of course you could, but it would be so expensive to use this much organic high nitrogen fertilizer that it just doesn't make sense to grow any sweet corn at that point, in my opinion. That's why you never see organic sweet corn fresh in supermarkets. It would just costs so much money to produce it that there isn't really a market for it. So in my opinion, if you want to grow organic corn, you need to stick to the old heirloom varieties of corn. That's why you can find things like organic corn flour. You can find organic canned corn that uses old strains of corn that are not nearly as sweet as modern strains. They can be grown organically, but for the modern sugar enhanced and super sweet varieties of corn, you just have to make peace with the fact that for it to be financially viable, you have to use these synthesized high nitrogen fertilizers for best results. And if you're interested in any of these water-soluble fertilizers, both synthesized and organic, I will make sure to link to them all in my Amazon storefront in the video description underneath the list, soluble fertilizers, and I'll also place direct links in the video description as well for your convenience. The third change that I made that revolutionized the way that I grow corn is I started to manually hand pollinate the corn. Corn plants consist of two very important parts. Up top, you have the tassels, which contain all of the male pollen, and then near the bottom, you have the silks, which turn into each individual kernel of corn. Now, in order to have a full ear of corn with all kernels present, you have to have that male pollen rain down from the tassels and touch every single individual 
individual silk because every single individual silk needs to be pollinated to get all of your kernels of corn. If any of those silks are not pollinated individually, you will have blank kernels in your ear. And that's the problem that I was having. When I'd harvest my corn, about 20% of the ears of corn would be blank and they would just look terrible. This is exactly why in commercial farms, corn is planted in enormous fields. Corn is predominantly wind pollinated. So when you make these big square fields of corn, it doesn't matter which direction the wind blows. It will basically take the pollen and stir it all up and it won't be able to escape. So natural wind pollination in these giant fields of corn basically pollinates all the kernels of corn 100%. You get fantastic pollination. In a backyard garden, when we are planting in these little tiny plots, you don't get that effect naturally because when the wind blows in one direction, all of the pollen will go in that direction. So it's only going to pollinate just a handful of the silks on their own. And you will get a tremendous number of blank kernels in your ears if you don't manually hand pollinate in these small clusters of corn. Luckily, hand pollinating your ears of corn is very simple. The male tassels usually form several days ahead of the female silks. So once you start seeing the tassels form, keep an eye out for the silks. When you start seeing the silks develop, you'll just need to go and cut off some of the male tassels and just drag the tassels along all of the individual silks. Make sure that you rub all the silks down so you get all that pollen all over the silks. The whole procedure only takes a couple of minutes and you should do that as the silks emerge. So over the course of that two week period or so that all of the silks are being produced, keep doing that with the tassels. When I did this, I was able to get 100% pollination on all of my ears of corn every single time so all of the kernels were there and they looked absolutely fantastic i know this sounds like just another thing that you have to do but i'm telling you do not skip this step if you want full ears of corn it's really fast and simple to do and it will be worth it in the end i promise and the fourth change that i made that revolutionized my corn growing game is i adopted and i stuck with a spraying routine unfortunately once the ears of corn start forming there is an enormous magnitude of different beetles and worms and boring pests that will try to eat your corn kernels alive and corn are just super susceptible to these pests. Fortunately, we do have a few natural and organic options that we can use in order to control these pests. The best organic insecticide that you can use for your corn is going to be spinosad. Spinosad is a natural bacteria that is deadly to a lot of different pests when they ingest it and it is very effective against beetles, worms, and caterpillars, which are the top pests for your corn. And what makes this insecticide so good is when you spray it, as long as it doesn't rain and you have dry weather, it tends to stay active for about three to seven days, depending on how intense your, your sun is and your weather in general. So if you have fairly dry summers, you can adopt a spraying routine of the spinosad and spray down those ears of corn about every four to seven days or so, depending on your weather, and that will help keep the insect damage at bay. Because it stays active for a while, if any of these pests start to repopulate your garden and start to feed, they will die when they start eating the sprayed foliage. So that's why this is so effective. Now, if you have very wet summers like I do, and you're stuck in a very rainy pattern where it's raining almost every day, this could wash off the spinosad, and that could be a problem because spinosad is not a contact killer. It has to actually sit on the foliage to be active. So if you're getting stuck in very rainy weather, you can use the natural insecticide pyrethrin. It is toxic to all insects on contact. Contact. So when I get stuck in these uh, rainy patterns, what I'll usually do is I'll take a small spray bottle like this and I'll mix the pyrethrin in there. I'll either use this or like a one or two gallon pump sprayer. And then I'll spray down the silks in the evening since I can't use the spinosad because it all gets washed off. Now the downside to both of these insecticides is they are both toxic to bees and bees are highly attracted to corn pollen. However, it's fairly easy to deal with as long as you don't broadcast spray your entire cornfield because I only grow a few dozen corn plants at any given time. What I like to do is I mix these insecticides in a pump sprayer and I only spray down the silks at the bottom of the corn plant, which is where all the pests go because you want to keep them off the ears of the corn. Up top, you have the tassels 
bristles with the pollen, you don't have to spray anywhere near them and you don't have to get any of these insecticides on the tassels. So the bees will be completely safe. The bees will have no reason to fly to the bottom of the corn plants where the ears of corn are. So as long as you're responsible with the way that you spray, you should be able to keep the bees very safe. If you're interested in any of these natural and organic insecticides, I will link to them all in my Amazon storefront in the video description underneath the list, disease management and insect control. And I'll also make sure to place some direct links in the video description for your convenience as well. Now you may be thinking growing sweet corn sure sounds like a lot more work than growing most things in our backyard garden. Well, that's because it is. It is a little bit more work than what we grow, but once you get these steps down pat, it starts becoming a routine and you become more comfortable with it and it becomes easier as time goes on. And like anything else, if you want to grow the best tasting, most natural food possible in your own backyard, you have to put in the work. And I know it does seem like a little bit of work, but I promise you, when you harvest those ears of sweet corn and you pull back the silks and you see, wow, that ear of corn is absolutely perfect and I grew it, there's just something so rewarding about that that you can't get anywhere else. And that right there are the four changes that I made that revolutionized the way that I grow sweet corn. So everybody, I sure hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and please ring that notification bell so you're notified when we release more videos like these. If you're curious about any of the products that I used in this video or that I use in my garden in general, they are all linked in the video description in my Amazon storefront link. And I also placed some direct links for the the products I use in this video for your convenience as well. While you're there, check out my spread shop for custom merch if you want to support the channel. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and I hope to see all of you again on the next one. All right, Dale, let's play some tug of war. Ready, Dale? Come on, buddy. Ready and catch. No, oh, you missed! You missed! What kind of terrible catch was that? Come on, growl. Ready, buddy? Let's try again. Yeah, there he goes! You got it! Good catch! Oh, you're so good!